because you're hungry for the word. So let's prepare ourselves this evening in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the option to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and focus on your word, that we can get things organized properly in our soul, that we can put it together in a way that we can communicate to other people about the mighty things that are in your word, and that we can give them the gospel accurately, and we can have a conversation with them to where they are challenged to listen to us, mainly by asking them questions, and seeing the Holy Spirit do his phenomenal job in convicting them of that truth. So we thank you for these things and pray that you'll help us to focus and concentrate for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Romans chapter 2, and we have just completed Romans chapter 2, verse 6. I guess we'll, to get up to speed, I'm going to read verse 5 and 6. I doubt that I will get to verse 7 this evening. Verse 5 says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. We've already made the point that that day of wrath is not referring to a future judgment, for instance, like the great white throne. The day of wrath is indeed the the day that you are unrepentant in your heart and storing up wrath. That's the day of wrath that's mentioned there. But we're we're completing verse 6. It says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds. The word deeds there is a plural of ergon, E-R-G-O-N, in the Greek, and that refers to works, or sometimes it's referred to as deeds. So we finish that, and we're going to move on into, well, I said we weren't going to do verse 7, but we, uh, uh, we're not going to do verse 8 tonight. Verse 7 to those, those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. So when we get to verse 7, we get into the wrath or the judgment of God in its final form. Remember that, that Paul was talking to unbelievers who had rejected the gospel <clears throat> and they were looking at other unbelievers in chapter 1 which ran the gamut with regards to sins of the tongue and mental attitude sins and overt sins and they thought they were better than they were. They were of the legalistic type and both of them <clears throat> are depending on their own works in order to be acceptable to God. So the first one we're going to look at that we, let me, if my computer will uh, cooperate with me here. You'll remember that Tuesday we went over the books. And the books are referring to the great white throne judgment Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, and we went over in in detail the books because those who are unbelievers, every unbeliever will stand before Jesus Christ as their judge and they're going to look into the books. The books are called, the books uh, are the books that were, had their good deeds or their works in there because that's what they are depending on. 
God is going to give them what they want. They want to be, uh, they want to be judged according to their works because they think their works will get them into heaven, but it's the very thing that will indict them. And they are, their name will not be in the book of life, even though it is in here there at birth. If you, anyone who dies rejecting Jesus Christ, then his name is blotted out of the book. So we went into great detail and all that, so we'll just get through that. And so that's the, that's the justice of God and the wrath that is uh, for the unbelievers. But there's also a day that believers are going to be evaluated according to their works. Now, Christ took care of the sin problem on the cross but he has deferred action on our works for both believers and unbelievers. And for the believers, we have the judgment seat of Christ. So we'll start here, I guess. Every person has his or her name recorded in the book of life at birth. And when an unbeliever dies, his name is removed from the book of life and judged at the great white throne. But I, I guess that I'm not down to it here. Let's just go all the way down here to where we start here. The judgment seat of Christ. This is for... Church-age believers only. That's something that some people might not know. That every church-age believer, that would, be, that would be the believers who live from the time of Christ's crucifixion. Fifty days after that, Jesus Christ... Uh, <clears throat> well, the church began. Jesus Christ was ascended. He ascended... Forty days after he was crucified, ten days later, the day of Pentecost began, and that is when the church age began. We don't know when it will end, but for every church age believer in that time frame, which of course includes us, will stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's where we're going to pick it up to get ready to go into this lesson where we start, lesson 63. So the judgment seat of Christ is for church-age believers only. Our works will be evaluated to determine who will receive eternal rewards and who will not. That's the purpose of it. Heaven is not going to be uh, equal, have equality among the people. I'm not talking about value. I'm talking about station. Those who grow in grace and knowledge and they apply the doctrines that they have learned, their good and faithful servants will be rewarded and they will be able to do things and go places and have things <clears throat> Excuse me. that the normal, just get by Christian will not have. It will take place after we receive our resurrection bodies at the rapture when Jesus Christ returns. Just as sins will not be mentioned at the great white throne, neither will they be mentioned at the judgment seat of Christ. The sin problem of all mankind was dealt with on the cross, and Jesus Christ said, it is finished. Here's a few more verses that you might want to jot down regarding the judgment seat of Christ. I didn't want to go through all of them. There's several of them. <clears throat> the first one is 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for the deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether divine good, whether it's divine good produced by the Holy Spirit, or worthless. I crossed out that word bad. It's phalos, P-H-A-L-U-S in the Greek, and it means worthless. And that would be human good. Now, I'm not going to go over 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, because it took some time to do it. That's where we ended last time, and I have a lot to cover, so we want to go on now with uh, Lesson 63. Now, the following verses are not salvific. Does there, I know everyone here knows what that means, but you might be tuning in and be new to this ministry. And not salvific means it, it does not pertain to eternal salvation. Some verses do and some verses don't. Sometimes being saved refers to eternal salvation, but most of the time it does not. It's just talking about temporal, the temporal deliverance. 
So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, and if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay upon earth. So judge, uh, the, Jesus Christ is an impartial judge, and he judges each person according to their work. And that's where we were in verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. That's Romans chapter 2 verse 6. It's very similar to what Peter said in First Peter chapter 1 verse 17. God does not have bias towards anyone. He's perfectly just. And there's not a shadow of turning in him with regards to partiality. That's why we should fear in our, during the time of our stay upon earth. There's a few verses. Most verses say over and over, do not fear. There was a couple of them, like this one, says we should fear. But we shouldn't fear our circumstances. We shouldn't fear man. We should fear God because he is impartial. And he is just. And that should get our attention. Then we have Revelation chapter 22 verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. You see, at the great white throne judgment, God takes care of the works issue for unbelievers. It will be what they are indicted for. They'll be tossed into the lake of fire. And for believers, we will be evaluated, not really us, but our works. What did we do? Did we waste the time or did we redeem the time in growing grace and knowledge? Psalm 62, 12. And loving kindness is thine, O Lord, for thou dost recompense a man according to his work. Now, remember I said these verses are not salvific. None of these have anything to do with being uh, with the, our place positionally in Christ. It's not talking about the gospel, receiving the gospel. It's experiential. Our time on earth, what we do, is going to be evaluated. That's what it's talking about. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 12. I'm going to read this to you, and if it doesn't seem to stick, we'll read the about four or five verses before that, which puts this more in context. But I, I added some things that should help you understand what the context is. Proverbs 24, 12 says, If you say, see, we did not know this, what are they talking about? Well, preceding this, this verse was people who were suffering and they were in need. So they are claiming that they did not know that others needed their help, which was a lie. They knew that they didn't help people because they just didn't want to. They didn't care about them. And so then it goes on. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? That's talking about God. In other words, God knows what you're doing. He knows that you are not helping people that you could help. You're not doing any good works. And he does not know it who keeps your soul. And does he not know it? In, the, in other words, God knows not only what you do, but he knows the mo motivations of your heart. He knows what you think. And so because of that, uh, you're not going to be in good stead here. And then it says, and, and will God, referring to God, and he will not render to man according to his works. And will he not render to man according to his works? In other words, of course he is. He's going to evaluate these people according to their work. So this is, again, showing that uh, to know the right thing to do and not to do it, to him it is a, it is a sin. That's in uh, James. And that's essentially what they're doing. We saw this, we weren't there to see it, but we read history, and it says a lot of people in Germany played the same little game here. That, well, we didn't know anybody needed anything. We didn't know that they needed help or anything like that. Of course, the stench of the ovens and the big smokestacks 
were everywhere. They knew what was going on. And so this is God warning them. He knows what you think. He knows what you could have done. So don't come across this and say, oh, we didn't know. So here's a more uh, judgment seat of Christ verses if you just want to jot these down. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6, 6 verse 7 through 12. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And 1 John 4, 17. So here they are again. These are verses other than the ones we just went over that deal with the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 10. Hebrews 6, verses 7 through 12. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And 1 John 4, 17. John chapter 5, verse 23 through 27 tells us that the Father committed all judgment to the Son. This means that Jesus Christ will be either your Savior or He will be your judge. Who makes that decision? Does God make that decision? No, you make that decision. Are you on the same wavelength that I am? In other words, people who think that they can work their way to heaven and all this kind of thing, needs to know that Jesus Christ will be your Savior, and the way he's your Savior is through faith alone and Christ alone, or he will be your judge. And if you think you have to work your way to heaven, most people who think that and believe it are very proud of the good works that they've done. That's when I think that's a handicap for them when it comes to accepting the gospel. They worked for years, and they can wax eloquent on all of the effort and time, maybe even expense, in doing good deeds. And yet, Jesus Christ will be their judge rather than their Savior. It all depends on whether you trust in Him to be saved, or in your own good deeds, or someone, or something else. That is what uh, you make that decision. You're either going to accept the singular work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, or you're going to try to be saved by your own good deeds, or someone else, or maybe something else. There's possibly no subject matter in the Bible that is more important than understanding the proper role of works in of, God, of works in God's plan for mankind. This is extremely important. That's why I've slowed down and, and going through it very meticulously, very specifically, because we need to have this down to where we don't even have to think about it. We can explain to anybody what the plan of, what, let me put it this way, what works have to do with God's plan. So I have a few bullet points here, just the major things that have to do with God's plan for works. The first bullet point, good works have absolutely nothing to do with eternal salvation. That's the most important one. It's the most basic thing. Good works have absolutely nothing to do with eternal salvation. And most people that you will come in contact with that profess to be a believer outside of your own church, one like this, are going to fall into this category. They think you have to be baptized. They think that you have to repent. They think that you have to do penance. They think that you have to be a good person. And on and on and on. And those are the ones, unless they change their mind, will be at the great white throne judgment. They might be good people, and they might do a lot of good works. You know, a lot of unbelievers are very likable. In fact, I had some Mormons next door to me when I lived in Houston, and they were some of the best neighbors you could possibly have. They were very good people and did a lot of good works. Well, I guess I would too if I thought that my eternal destiny depended on that. I remember the uh, daughter of, of my neighbors next door came over and was doing something for us, Perry and I, and 
we all, it was a hot summer, and we said, would you like some tea, some iced tea? Oh, no, I can't have iced tea. I thought, okay. <laughs> so it's not how good a person is. It's what think they of Christ. Is he their Savior because of the work he did and the atonement he provided? Or is he need some help? Do we need to ha have to add our good works to it, which is blasphemous? The second point is producing good works is not evidence that one has been saved. You've probably been around people before and you may be talking about a neighbor or a friend or somebody and they're just so nice and they've done all these good things. And somebody might mention, boy, she's surely going to make it to heaven. Well, I hope when someone makes a comment like that that you just don't leave, you don't leave it floating out there in the air, that you will take that opportunity to say, well, she might be in heaven, but it's not because she was so nice and so good. And then you'll have the opportunity for people to say, what are you talking about? And when they ask you, well, you can give it to them. Give them the gospel. The third point here is, believers are commanded to perform good works after they are saved, but not in order to be saved. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It's towards the back a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Most of you already know this, this Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 by heart. And good for you. We all need to know this because this is a key verse. This is one of the most powerful verses regarding salvation. But few know anything about 10. Verse 10. So verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that is salvific. Of course, you can tell that that is talking about believing in Jesus Christ, in faith alone, in Christ alone. And so you're saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And then verse 9 says, not as a result of works that no man should boast. So of course it's a, if it's a gift, it can't be by works. Gifts, a gift and works are like trying to mix oil and water. Just doesn't do a very good job, does it? Now, but here's my point in verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Isn't that amazing? You're looking at the verse above it, verse 8, that we've been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It's not of works. And then verse 10 it says that we were created for good works. What's the difference? Well, the verse, verses 8 and 9 are salvific. It refers to accepting the gospel, how we're saved. And verse 10 is how we live after we are saved, post-salvation. And so we were created unto good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So good works have nothing to do with salvation, eternal salvation, but they have everything to do with our lives after we are saved. We were created unto good works. You can't get any closer to that to have two verses that are talking about Salvation being a gift, and it's not of works. And then the very next verse, verse 10 says, but you were created under good works. You have to, that's why this, this point right here is so important. Believers are commanded to perform good works after they are saved, <clears throat> excuse me, but not in order to be saved. I could give you a list of, of commands, but that should, should suffice. There are many well-known pastors and theologians who have missed, misunderstood the proper role of works. I'm talking about a lot of them. And I have a quote here from one that is well-known. If I said his name, you would know who he was, but I, I'm not going to put his name in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. But just because someone is well-known, they might be on TV, they might have thousands of listeners, and... That doesn't mean that 
they understand the proper role of works in God's plan. So here's the quote. Watch it very carefully. The deeds of the redeemed are not the basis of their salvation. Do you agree to that? Oh, hardly. But the evidence of it, they are not perfect and are prone to sin, but there is undeniable evidence of righteousness in their lives. So he's saying that he would agree. We would say that salvation is not of works. You can't work in order to be saved. But then to say that the excuse me, the deeds of the, those who are redeemed, of believers, are not the basis of their salvation, but the evidence of it. He just threw a wrench in the whole works right there. I'll, we'll see as we go on here. Just follow me as we, this unfolds. If the evidence of being saved is based on deeds, our works, it's the, the same word is, is sometimes translated as deeds, sometimes as works. So if the evidence of being saved is based on works, then works would be necessary to be saved. Now listen, the word there that you need to key on is evidence. Because he said that good works are not the, the basis of being saved, but the evidence of being saved. That's where all of us should really draw the mark right there. If evidence of being saved is based on works, then works should be necessary to be saved. No works means no evidence, and no evidence means no salvation. You get that? You can hardly say that works don't save you, but you have the, the, the basis of, of knowing that you are saved is based on your works. What is that saying? It still works, right? I don't think y'all are getting it. I'm on, maybe I'm, I'm not making it clear enough. If the evidence of being saved is based on works, then works would be necessary to be saved, right? In other words, if the, if the evidence is required of doing good works, then it's about good works, right? In other words, if you have no works, it means you have no evidence. If you're not working, you don't have any evidence of works. And no evidence, according to what this person says, would mean no salvation. Now look at it up here again. I'm right here. Right here. The deeds of the redeemed are not the basis of their salvation, but the evidence of it is. In other words, if you ask someone, how do you know that you're saved? You would say, well, because of my good works. That's the evidence. But everyone does at least one good work in their life. The question is, how many good works does it take to be enough to count as sufficient evidence that one has righteousness in his life? Look up here again from this quote. They are not perfect. In other words, they sin and they are prone to sin, but there is undeniable evidence of righteousness in their lives. How do you know that there's righteousness in your life? It's because of your works. That's what he's saying. And I say, not so. The evidence for our salvation is not our works. And the evidence of righteousness in our lives is not of works either. You know what the essence of it? What this stands on? Your faith, not your works. This will unfold as we go on. So when I say that everyone does one good work in their life, 
the question, question is how many good works does it take to be enough to count as sufficient evidence that one has righteousness in his life? This person's up here says, but there is undeniable evidence of righteousness in their lives. Based on what? According to what this is saying. You tell me. Their works. Does righteousness in us come from our works? So the reason I said everyone does a good work, in other words, people who do, let's say there's people who do one good work in their life, or maybe two, maybe a dozen, whatever it is, and, and you would ask them, do you have righteousness in your life? Are you saved on the basis of the good works that you have done? Because like, according to this person, that's, that, that's the evidence is your good works. Most people would say no, wouldn't you? I mean, if let's say you're an adult, you're 25 years old, and someone says, now, salvation is not is not acquired by your good works, but the evidence of it is the basis that you are saved. And they would say, how about you? How many good works do you have? You, you can think through it, and maybe you have one or two good works. Do you think they're going to say that that's sufficient uh, evidence that you have righteousness in your life? It always goes to works, and it always goes to how many works have you done. Can anyone definitively say how many good works the Bible requires before they are considered to be they, meaning their works, are considered to be evidence that one is saved. Have you ever been asked that question? Listen to it again. Can anyone, any person, definitively say how many good works the Bible requires before they are considered, the, their works are considered to be evidence that one is saved? Because he just said right up here, the, de the deeds of the redeemed are not the basis of their salvation, but the evidence of it is. The evidence of their good deeds is the basis of their salvation. Does that, does that ring for you? And so the question here is, can anyone go to the Bible and tell you how many sins that you have to produce before they would be considered to be evidence that you are saved? Can anyone do that? What do you think? No, they cannot. Why? Because it's not there. You can search the Bible from stem to stern, and there's not one verse anywhere in it that will tell you how many works that you have to, good works that you have to perform in order for them to be considered evidence that you are indeed saved. Because evidence of being saved does not come from your good works. And that's a big problem. If you don't, if you don't have a number, some sense of how many good works you need to produce, then how can you have eternal security? How can you not go, go along every day and wonder, have I done enough good works today to be evidence that I'm truly saved? This is not theoretical. People who are well, Calvinists believe this. They believe that God chooses them. They don't choose God. And that Jesus Christ didn't die for the sins of the world. He only died for the sins of those who God chose to save. And that's a big problem when you get to chapter 20 in Romans and it says that all unbelievers are going to be judged according to their works, not according to their sins. That's because Christ has paid for their sins. But it's not only Calvinists, there's a lot of people that don't know the truth and they go around every day hoping beyond hope that they're good enough to be saved. I've done funerals before and most of the time there are people at funerals who are unsaved and they are already thinking about death and what's going to happen to them when they die and so I ask the question, if you're here and 
you are concerned whether you're good enough to go to heaven or not, I've got something to tell you. You don't have to be good to go to heaven. And I've seen the, the shock on their face because their whole life they've been told you have to be good, be good person and good deeds to get to heaven. And it's, it, it, they just nearly gasped. Some of them literally gasped. I said, you don't have to be good, you have to be perfect. Then they get the point. There was, there was only one that was good enough to go to the cross, the only one that was qualified to go to the cross to pay for our sins. So no one can tell you how many good works it takes in order to have the evidence that you have been saved because it doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with eternal salvation. Eternal salvation is acquired in a moment of time when you hear the gospel and you hear that Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross and anyone who accepts his work on the cross in that moment they're born again and the basis of their salvation is their faith in Christ not works. Here's a few verses. Um, oh, well, i got one more sentence here. If that cannot be ascertained, in other words, and I just tried to explain, it cannot be ascertained. Nobody can tell you how many work, good works you have to do because they're not even an issue with regards to salvation. If that cannot be ascertained, how could anyone be confident that they are saved? And how can anybody... This is... This is so important for people to understand that salvation is not a process. In fact, eternal life and God's own righteousness is only given to you as a gift. Books have nothing to do with it. And so people go through their whole life agonizing and being worried and undone because they're not sure whether they're going to heaven or not. Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says this, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, not his works. Why are we talking about righteousness here? Because look what he says. But there is undeniable evidence of righteousness in their lives. Why? Because they have evidence of good works. The good works is evidence that they're being redeemed. But there is undeniable evidence of righteousness in their lives. What is the undeniable ev evidence that he's talking about here? Good works. The deeds of the redeemed are not the basis for their salvation, but the evidence of deeds is the basis for their salvation. They are not perfect, and they are prone to sin, but there is undeniable evidence through their good works that righteousness is in their lives. <coughs> Keep them in mind as we go over these other verses. That's why it says here, to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That's the basis of having righteousness, is faith, not works. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now listen to this question here. If our works don't justify us, nor do they account for righteousness, then how can they be evidence that we are saved? That's a good question to ask people who are working for their salvation. And I have, I'm going to go over even more verses here that show that we are not justified by our works, but we're justified, justified by our faith. And we do get the gift of righteousness, just like we get the gift of eternal life, by faith as well. If somebody, and this has happened to me, by, by the way, several times, if somebody asked me, are you saved? And I said, absolutely. 
How do you know? It's simple. I put my faith alone in Christ alone. He died for me on the cross, and I believe it. That's the basis of my salvation. You ask most people that, and you can tell a lot of times if they're saved or if they're not. Because if you ask a person, are you saved, and they say yes, and you say, how do you know, and they start naming out good works, are they saved? Did they? How can they receive a gift from God by working for it? You can't. And it's the only way that God gives them. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. But if, and if is a first class conditional clause there, meaning it's true, but if it, referring to salvation, is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. We are saved by grace. Christ took care of our sin problem through grace. But if we want to work in any way towards that, then it's no longer of grace, then it is on, on, only by works. Eternal life and God's righteousness are gifts of God. Here's some birth verses. You might want to jot these down because a lot of people don't know that these are gifts. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. That's the gift of eternal life. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you have Romans 5, 17 that says that God's righteousness is a gift as well. So eternal life and God's righteousness are gifts of God given to those who believe in Jesus Christ based solely on His grace. If works had anything to do with it, then it would no longer be on the basis of grace. Working for a gift changes it to something owed. If someone has ever given you a gift and you thought it was maybe more grandiose than you deserve, and you say, here, let me give you a little something for it. If the person gives you that gift because you gave them payment for it, it's no longer a gift. Now up here we see this as well. Look at this. I'm telling you all this, and here's the, the proof is in the pudding here. After he says, there, these people who are, whose basis of their salvation is not their works, but the evidence of it, there has to be good works for there to be evidence, right? James chapter 2, verse 14 through 20 and verse 26. These are the verses that put the coup de grace on what he's saying because they are about being saved by works. And so we're going to go there. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 20 and 26 are given as references in the quote above to support the idea that faith plus evidence of works are necessary to be saved. That's the whole, po whole point. Anytime you ask a person, are you saved? And they say, yes, again. How do you know? Now, I go to church, I've been baptized, I've been confirmed, and I'm a good person, and blah, 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 blah. Is that person saved? Well, he might be saved and just be confused, but you better believe what he's saying because if he says that, you know that he is not saved. Why? He is basing the evidence of being saved on works rather than his faith. So, these verses are given as a reference to quote the above to support the idea that faith plus evidence of works are necessary to be saved. So let's look at this. First of all, I picked out three verses in James, which is the most difficult ones for some people 
And they have more to do with what that idea is that you have to have evidence of works in order to be saved. The first one is James chapter 2, verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? The next one is James 2, 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And because some people say, oh yeah, you have to have faith, but you also have to have works, and they go here to substantiate it. And then the last one here is James 2.26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, if you're not grounded in the word, and you know absolutely for certain that the Bible does not say that you have to have works in order to be eternally saved, if you don't know that, you could fall for this and think, oh, well, I better really kick it into gear. I don't have much time. I better get a lot of works done. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but this says that uh, if you, uh, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. I bet you understand how people get confused here. And the people who say that uh, the only way you can know that you're saved is evidence of your good works, this is where they go first. And it traps a lot of people. So, these are the main verses that those who believe that one must produce good works in order to persevere or maintain their salvation. They say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. Is that all? Oh, well, you have to persevere. Well, what does that mean? Well, you have to keep on working. Why? Because the evidence of Salvation is my works. If I quit working, then it means one or two things. It means either I've lost my salvation or it means I never had it to begin with because I need to keep persevering to prove by my, my, my works. That's the evidence that I'm, that I'm saved. And if I quit producing works, then my evidence is gone. So we're going to ask some questions that must be answered in order to understand these verses. Oh, golly, I can't believe it's that late already. Okay, well, here we go. We'll see how far we get. Number one, are believers or unbelievers being addressed here? That's the number one question there. And the answer is believers. And that's a shock. Because everybody, now nearly everybody, thinks that these verses are talking about eternal salvation, and they are not. They are not salvific. James was talking to believers who were deadbeats. Oh, they were saved. They're called brethren. I'm going to show you that in a moment now. But the thing is, they weren't doing any good works. And so when it says, well, we'll it, this will unfold as we go through there. So what I'm saying, they are believers. You won't jot these down. You might want to turn to James starting with chapter 2, verse 14, and jot these down so you'll know that you're talking to believers, or, or James is talking to believers. Why would be James, James talking about all these things that you have to be saved eternally, accept the gospel to people who are already saved? He wouldn't do that. That's not what it's about. So, the answer, are believers or unbelievers being addressed? The answer is believers. James chapter 2, verse 1, and James chapter 4, verse 5. And correlating to that same type of verse, same context is 1 Corinthians 3, 1, and 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Those are verses that show that he is talking to believers. And by the way, when you look at this, James 2, 14, what use is it, my what? Brethren. Now some would say, oh, well, he's just saying this brethren because they're Jews it's more than that I just showed you where you can find that he's talking to believers the, the second thing the second point here can that faith and I have here in brackets without works save him that's another question that we need to answer and here's the answer the short answer is no Faith without works cannot save him. 
But we're not talking about eternal salvation. We're talking about a believer who is a deadbeat. And he's doing no works. He's already saved. So the answer is no. But the question is, save him from what? His faith alone in Christ has already secured his eternal life for him. But faith without works will not save him from divine discipline, loss of rewards, or a wasted, miserable life. James is cranking up on these believers because they were deadbeats. They wouldn't do anything. People would come up to him and they needed, they were naked and they needed food and they would say, well, go and be fed and be, be clothed and wouldn't do anything for them. They didn't care. There was no good works going on. They were selfish. They were self-centered. So the answer to that, can faith without works save him or deliver him? No, it cannot. So we have to ask, save from what? Most people think save from the lake of fire. But these are believers already. They have been sanctified, positionally sanctified. They have received eternal life as a gift. And they receive the righteousness of God as a gift. And in Romans, it, the chapters, uh, I'm not sure about, but it's in Romans that it says the, the calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable. Once God gives you eternal life, once he gives you his own righteousness or anything else, it's impossible for him to take it back. They're irrevocable. So it's not saving someone that is already secure in, the, in their eternal life. It's not about save from hell, but faith without works will not save a believer from divine discipline, loss of rewards, or a wasted, miserable life. Point number three. That a man is justified by works. And my question then is, before whom? The answer is, we are justified before God by our faith, and we are justified before man by our works. If it was any other way, then the Apostle Paul and James would be at odds with one another. If, this, if, if these verses were talking about eternal salvation, then Paul, in we just saw it in the book to Ephesians, 2, 8, 9, then they're at, at odds with one another. But they're not, because Paul is talking about eternal salvation, and James is talking about temporary deliverance from a wasted life and no rewards. That's what they're saved from. Well, it's not, they're not saved from it if they have no good works. Point number four. And it says, and not by faith alone. I think that was verse number 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So I'm looking at faith and not by faith alone. And my question is, does this refer to securing eternal salvation or securing temporary deliverance? In other words, is this about an unbeliever that is trying to secure salvation or a believer who is trying to secure temporary deliverance? The answer is temporary deliverance because believers need to produce good works to be delivered from divine discipline and to obtain eternal rewards. You get that? All of us, we're saved. Our, our name is in the book of life. It will never be erased. Our, our, our name is in the Lamb's book of life. It was written in eternity past before the world was even created. We are set. Nothing can change that. But work believers who are in that very stable position positionally are very wobbly when it comes to experiential works. 
After we're saved, God doesn't expect us to say, oh, well, we're saved, we can just just forget about helping other people. It doesn't matter what we do, we're still going to go to heaven. We understand that. But faith without works for believers will not deliver them from the wrath of God for disobedience and arrogance and self-centeredness. It's temporary deliverance that even verse 1 is talking about. I mean, verse uh, 14. What, is it, what use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If you're talking about eternal salvation, the answer would be yes. But it's not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about temporary deliverance from a wasted life and divine discipline. So that if you're talking about a believer, the answer would be no. Faith without works cannot deliver a believer from the consequences of being a disobedient, hard-headed, faultless, no love towards other people. His faith he had at salvation cannot save him from temporal, temporal suffering. And now I'll do number five. Faith, is, uh, faith without works is dead. That's in verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So we're asking questions about this. Does this refer to the faith that's dead in securing eternal salvation? In other words, is faith without works dead in securing eternal salvation because it is minus works? Is that what it's talking about? Because you have to have works to go along with your faith. Is it talking about that? Or is it the faith that's dead in the lives of dis deadbeat, disobedient, selfish believers who produce no, uh, no good works? It is the latter. You saw the verses that says that not of works lest any should boast. And there's a lot more. So here's the answer to that question. It is the latter. Deadbeat, disobedient believers are not saved from divine discipline. God has told them, love, love your neighbor. We call it unconditional love. You love them. You help them. Even be kind to your enemies. All these type of things. Ah, that's not for me. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to vegetate. So the faith without works is germane to deadbeat, disobedient believers who are not fulfilling their mission because they are self-centered and don't care about other people or about pleasing God. That's when faith without works winds up with great discipline, even sometimes the sin of the death. Here's the last thing that I can put out right now. The evidence that one has been eternally saved is based on the fact that he has put his faith alone in Christ alone. God's Word says that the moment we do that, we receive the gift of eternal life, which, by the way, is eternal. So whenever anybody asks me, and I hope whenever anyone asks you, are you saved? And you say, absolutely. And they say, how do you know? What I say is because I put my faith alone in Christ alone. I'm trusting in him for my eternal salvation. And works have nothing to do with that whatsoever. Okay, well... I'm going to put these notes on the internet uh, when I get home, and the, this uh, video will be on there as well. 
I know this is kind of deep stuff. I had a long, it took me a long time. I spent trying to get these, these, answers to these questions. It's hard to formulate the questions and then it's hard to formulate the answers. But this is so important because so many people believe that, yeah, we can believe in Jesus Christ, but that's not enough. And they use those verses to try to go there and they miss the whole context altogether. It's always faith alone in Christ alone. It's always by grace and not by works. Let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we can look at this so very important issue. We pray that you will structure this in our own souls, that we will be able to explain it to other people. That they will see that they're working, everything that they're working for is going to be held against them. It's that what they will be indicted for at the great white throne judgment. It's so wonderful to recognize your grace and the extent of it. The only way that we can be right with you is to accept the atonement that Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross. And in that moment, through faith, then we have eternal life and we have your own righteousness imputed to us and many other things as well. I think it would be a good idea for us to think about these things Go over in our own mind how we would explain this to other people, people who don't know any better. They've been told their whole life that it's by works. Yeah, you believe in Jesus, but you also have to work. We pray that the Holy Spirit will take the words of truth that we give to them and convict them to be humble and for them also to become part of your royal family by faith alone in Christ alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.